Okay, so welcome everyone to the fifth annual Wranglers Lecture, which also this year doubles as a keynote address of the annual meeting of the Association of Ancient Historians. The Wranglers Lecture was established to honor Jerry and Jeannie Wranglers, and Jerry is here in the audience, uh, they, through their endowment of a chair in ancient Greek history and their support of Hellenic studies, they have helped create a thriving program in Greek history here at UC San Diego. I see this lecture series also as an opportunity to honor scholars of Greek history who approach the subject from a novel perspective and whose research has helped us redefine the study of the ancient Greek world. And so for me, this year's speaker perfectly exemplifies these values. Greg Anderson is a professor of history at the Ohio State University. His first book, The Athenian Experiment, Building an Imagined Political Community in, Ath in Ancient Athens, 508 to 490 BC, completely reconceptualized archaic Athenian history. And from there, his interests sort of broadened, or maybe they were always there, but at least in terms of publication, this becomes more obvious. Um, they broadened from focusing on the formation of the Athenian state to thinking about statehood more generally and more globally, as we can see um, in his co-edited volume, State Formations, Global Histories and Cultures of Statehood, which was published by Cambridge in 2018. And his publications also began to reflect um, his interest and preoccupation with how to practice pre-modern history. And these interests uh, culminated in his brilliant book, The Realness of Things Past, Ancient Greece and Ontological History, published by Oxford University Press in 2018. And the slide that's on um, Greg's PowerPoint actually is the image that's on the book too, uh, the book cover. But despite the title uh, or having the words ancient Greece in it, part, um, the, the book I think is actually really useful for any pre-modern historian. In this book, Greg challenges us to produce more, and this is a quote, ethically defensible, more philosophically robust and more historically meaningful histories by taking an ontological turn. And for Greg, this ontological turn involves shedding our dualist, modernist, um, materialist, um, Western, individualist, what am I leaving out, secular, um, even anthropomorphic, I would say, uh, commitments in our study of the pre-modern um, past. And instead he urges us to move towards a non-dual historical practice. And in his book, he shows what this might look like by focusing on the case study of Athens. In the words of one of the reviewers of the book, and I, don't, I can't put it any better, uh, he offers no less than a paradigm shift of seismic proportions with the potential for equally world-shaking results. And Greg is also an award-winning teacher and his commitment to transforming our understanding of the ancient world, I think is also evident in the various public facing activities that he has engaged in, including various TED talks, some of which now have over 3 million views. And I'm going to drop some of these in the chat box um, as soon as Greg takes things over from me. Um, but I will say that I had students in my archaic Greek history class watch um, during the first week of class, one of his TED Talks entitled What Ancient Civilizations Teach Us About Reality, and it worked perfectly, um, and uh, the students were still raving about it at the end of the quarter. So thank you for letting me do that. Uh, his current book project has the awesome title, uh, Across the Pluriverse, Life in Other Worlds of the Past, Present, and Future. And I, for one, would happily go along this ride um, across the pluriverse. So his talk to us today is um, pluriversal history towards a many worlds vision of the past. So please join me in welcoming Greg Anderson. Well, thank you so much, Denise, uh, for inviting me and giving me such a warm and generous introduction. Um, and also thank you to, to Jerry Wranglers for, of course, endowing the lecture series. And I'm very honored to be uh, included in the distinguished list of speakers. 
Um, I'm doubly honored that the talk is being shared with colleagues at the uh, annual meeting of the Association for Ancient, of Ancient Historians as a keynote lecture. And thank you all for tuning in and what is, I know, a busy time for many of us, perhaps most of us. I just wish we could all be together in person, maybe someday. Um, just a couple of preliminaries before we go diving in. Uh, first of all, the subject, uh, as Denise's introduction has suggested and the title suggests, uh, this talk is ultimately about the nature of reality itself from a historian's perspective. But ancient Greece will feature in there, but it'll be one of a number of case studies, if you like. Second, on the images, um, uh, to keep things visually interesting, I have assembled quite a large cast of uh, slides, um, but some of the phenomena I talk about, things and ideas are rather hard to represent visually. So I've chosen to use images that are more, if we like, elusive or suggestive or evocative than literal or definitive. So I would just please ask that you view them uh, in that spirit. Um, and for those intrigued by the ideas in the talk, uh, who would like to read more, uh, there is a uh, bibliography included in the chat, or if you like, a further reading section that's uh, uh, things that I found helpful and useful and that have uh, enlightened me in some way along the line suggested in the talk. Finally, I'll just read a quick land acknowledgement uh, before embarking and then I'll go straight into the talk. This is adapted from a statement by uh, Shane Creeping Bear, who is the Dean of Admissions at Antioch College here in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and a member of the Kiowa tribe. I acknowledge that the land I'm speaking from was unceded and stolen. I acknowledge the land of the Shawnee, Delaware, Potawatomi, Miami, Wayandot, Seneca, Chippewa, Ottawa, Wapakoneta. Over 39 historic nations and bands call this land their home. I acknowledge these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, let us start. We tell ourselves that there is just one ultimate reality out there, a single fixed world of experience ruled by universal laws of science and nature. But the historical record suggests otherwise. If we decolonize modern historical thinking, allowing the peoples we study to decide for themselves what was true and real in their experience, our picture of the larger human story will dramatically change. We will begin to see how other real worlds are entirely possible. We will see how humans have always lived in a pluriverse of many worlds, not in a universe of just one. And this new vision of the past will help transform the way we see the present and the future. Now, when human communities sustain themselves successfully, they inevitably amass knowledge about the contents of the world in which they live. They preserve and transmit this wisdom through stories, whether these take the form of ritual songs and dances, parables in sacred texts, philosophical treatises, or equations in physics journals. These stories try to capture the essential truths of existence, timeless certainties about, say, the origins of the world, relations between humans and non-humans, the nature of good and evil, the meaning of personhood, family and community, and the sources, means and ends of life itself. Together, such stories provide a shared vision of the foundations of reality, a tried and tested model of the world to live by. And this model is duly baked into all the norms and practices on which the life of the community is staked. When one then surveys the evidence for the models of reality that different historical communities have successfully lived by, one is struck by their incredible diversity. Different ways of life have been staked upon very different truths about the world. To get a sense of this diversity, we can begin by comparing our own basic modern Western model with several non-modern examples. Now, in the modern West, we're socialized to think of reality as a more or less boundless universal space, one that contains multitudes of objects that all spontaneously obey timeless physical laws of nature. To qualify as real in this mechanical universe, things must be reducible to materialities that are somehow observable to humans. 
whether they are directly visible material things like sand grains, persons and planets, or things that are detectable through their perceived material effects, like atoms, gravity and wind. At the same time, our world denies true realness to unobservable things that seem to defy nature's physical laws, like gods, demons and other so-called supernatural phenomena. In the end, such things are just sub subjective ideas which exist only in the human mind. By contrast, a real phenomenon is something that exists objectively, independent of all human thought, something whose innate properties make it materially self-evident to humans. So which real things in our modern model of the world are the most important? The short answer is human beings. Humans in our reality are always exceptional. Like other things, we, are, we humans are programmed to function as freestanding, self-contained entities, to stand for ourselves as individuals. But unlike all other things, we are also born with a personhood, which gives us special properties like consciousness, reason, language, agency, and rights to life, liberty, and estate. In other words, we humans are the only true subjects in a universe full of objects. We are completely unaccountable, to any non-human or superhuman persons, because no such beings really exist. And we alone are capable of judging what is real and unreal, since we alone can know the world objectively, viewing it as if from outside, as something separate from ourselves, like gods. As a result, our model of reality inevitably divides itself into two distinct orders, a higher and a lower order of being. The higher order is what we call culture, a kind of world within a world which contains exclusively human things like persons and cities, societies and economies, arts and sciences. The lower order we call nature, seeing it merely as an environment of impersonal objects and mechanical processes. With our inalienable rights and our unaccountability to non-humans, we humans are thus authorized to rule and exploit the natural order however we want. This vision of a secular material world dominated by an all-powerful species of human individuals duly shapes our preferred modern way of life with its secular democracies, its capitalist economies, and its rights-based notions of citizenship. If we humans are programmed to live ultimately for ourselves as rational, acquisitive, self-contained beings, it makes sense to order our lives in ways that will allow such beings to thrive and prosper. It makes sense to separate off a sacred sphere of irrational faith in gods from a secular sphere where all the real business of life can be transacted. It makes sense to use forms of government which grant all subjects their right to self-determination. Yet it also makes sense to confine this government within its own realm of public power thereby separating it from the private realms of society and economy, where individuals can be free to act in their, on their natural instincts to manage and enrich themselves. But for all its familiarity, this modern Western model of reality is radically different from the models which all non-modern peoples have lived by. But what do these other worlds look like? Let us now take a brief tour through history's vast pluriverse of non-modern worlds, visiting examples from Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. We come first to the reality of the Lakota. Before it was brutally diminished by treaties and reservations, the world of the Lakota radiated out far and wide from the fixed central site of Hesapa, the Black Hills in the modern state of South Dakota. For the Lakota, these hills were the heart of everything that is, the literal heart of the earth goddess Maka. As such, prominent landmarks in and around the hills, like the Bear's Lodge and the making of Owl's Hill, mirrored star constellations in the heavens, where a parallel community of celestial beings lived much as the Lakota did in the realm below. Together, these heavenly and terrestrial realms constituted a single cosmic ecology one that had been willed into existence by Wakan Tanka, the great mystery who made all life possible. Within the terrestrial realm of this cosmos, there was nothing at all special about humans. 
Wakantanka had imbued all the things of the earth with a kind of vital force that made the entire world of Lakota experience radically alive. Everything, even a stone, a tree or a river, was in some sense a person with a human-like will, agency and subjectivity. This was a world that contained no inert, impersonal objects. Instead, it teemed with subjects of all forms, human and non-human, all of whom were expected to contribute in some way to the life of the cosmos as a whole. Moreover, because all the things of the earthly realm were made from Maka's own materials, everything there was intrinsically related to everything else. This was a fully symbiotic world, a cosmic ecology built on life-sustaining kinships between humans, non-humans, and more than humans. It was thus a world that the Lakota would, would address in their ritual blessings as mitakuye oyesi, or all my relation. The mutual accountability and kinship between humans and non-humans is beautifully expressed by Chief Luther Standing Bear in his book, Land of the Spotted Eagle, where he looks back on a world that was destroyed by settler colonialism in the 19th century. And I quote, from Wakantanka, there came a great unifying life force that flowed in and through all things. The flowers of the plains, blowing winds, rocks, trees, birds, animals, and was the same force that was breathed into the first man. Kinship with all creatures of the earth, sky and water was a real and active principle. For the animal and bird worlds, there existed a brotherly feeling that kept the Lakota safe among them. The wolf, duck, eagle hawk, spider, bear, and other creatures had marvelous powers, and each one was useful and helpful to us. Then there were the warriors who lived in the sky and dashed about on their spirited horses during a thunderstorm, their lashes, lances clashing with the thunder and glittering with the lightning. There was Wiwila, the living spirit of the spring, and the stones that flew like a bird and talked like a man. Everything was possessed of personality, only differing from us in form. From the Great Plains, we now transport ourselves to a remote part of southern Mali, where we can glimpse the world of the Dogon people, who live in mud brick villages arrayed along the Bandiagara escarpment. In this characteristically West African kind of reality, the most important persons are the small multitudes of gods, spirits, and deceased ancestors, which coexist with humans in each village microcosm. All of these beings are invisible, but the effects of their wills and interventions are readily observable in phenomena like weather patterns, rainfall, crop yields, family prosperity, and bodily health. Chief among the invisible masters of reality are Ama, the creator sky god, Lewe, the chthonic earth god, and Nomo, the god of water. Of these, Ama is supreme, ensuring overall harmony in the cosmos. He continually monitors and regulates the conduct of humans, sending blessings when they behave well, but sending banes like storms and diseases when they commit adulteries, thefts and other acts that disturb the cosmic equilibrium. Such is Amma's power that each village is circumscribed by his distinctive conical shrines, which together offer a kind of protective shield against invaders, evil spirits, witchcraft, sickness, and so on. The Dogon make regular sacrifices and libations at these sites, which keep the shrines active and effective by transferring to them the niyama, the vital force or energy of a living substance like blood or millet. Then there are the invisible bush spirits like the Yenyu, the Yeba, and the huge Jinu, which manifest themselves as whirlwinds, light flashes, and otherworldly sounds. Like the gods, these spirits are capricious agencies. Some may actively help humans by providing medicinal substances or helping them solve daily problems through divination. Others may harm humans by attacking them, inflicting diseases on them, or exchanging their body parts, especially their eyes, thus rendering them blind. To ward off, su ward off such harms, families fill the walls and doorways of their compounds with all manner of protective devices from medicinal plants, cow tails and arrows, to human hair and large sticks, all of which must again be activated with Niyama through sacrifices. 
Also helping families are their ancestral spirits who play a kind of intermediary role between the visible and the invisible realms. As ex-humans, the ancestors still share the interests and values of the living and listen when their descendants address them at sacrifices and burial rites. But as inhabitants of the invisible realm, these ancestors can meet, dine, talk, and plead with the gods, conveying to them the needs and hopes of their kin. One does not become an efficacious ancestor automatically upon one's death. One must be transformed from a human to a more than human. This process is accomplished only through a long sequence of rituals which celebrate one's life, beginning with the burial itself, followed by the new Yana ceremony for all those who die in a given year, followed by the spectacular Dhamma festival, which is held only once every 12 years, where mass dancers represent a host of non-human celebrants. The Dhamma thus brings together all the inhabitants of the visible realm to observe the passage of deceased humans to the invisible beyond. Within the visible realm, the Dogon recognize a binary division between the human space of the village and the non-human space of the bush. But this is not at all like modernity's division between a higher order of culture and a lower order of nature. On the contrary, the bush is full of non-human persons who must be respected because they supply humans with wisdom, knowledge, power, and all the other things which make life possible. For example, trees like the baobab supply humans with all manner of life-sustaining items from their leaves, seeds, fruit, and wood pulp. But humans who would use their parts for healing purposes must get their permission first. Likewise, millet happily furnishes the Dogon with their dietary staples, but it will vanish from their granaries if it hears disrespectful human speech with its ears. Since some animals like crocodiles, serpents, rainbirds, and tortoises are actual incarnations of Ama, they must be honored with ritual offerings. Others like the fox, the hyena, and the red ant are used by Ama to reveal the future to humans, so long as divination is practiced in the prescribed respectful way. More generally, the bush is a space full of wondrous other persons with lives, wills, and interests of their own. A space where rocks, gullies, and sand dunes move freely of their own accord, where trees converse with one another, and where animals will evade human hunters because they always know the future. So far from exploiting the bush, the Dogon worry that they will diminish its life-sustaining powers whenever they disturb its contents. Whoops. Let's go back. And the respectful reciprocity which defines the relations of the Dogon with the non-humans of their world, visible and invisible, also defines relations within the human community itself. The mutual interdependency between male and female, young and old, is simply taken for granted. All have their complementary roles to play in the lives of their families and villages. No single person or family could exist and thrive without the others. And in this world where all being is inherently relational, all human persons are actually individuals, not individuals, in that they are all composed of three essential parts that are gifts from others. The physical body or goju they receive from their father. The hakile, their character or personality, comes from their mother or their father. And their kikine, their vital life spirit, comes from Anna Ama himself. The very idea of a natural human individual would make no sense at all in this very different world. From Dogon land, we pass next across the Blue Rivers to early Ming China. Here we see highly self-conscious efforts to uh, mold experience to fit a prescribed model of reality. After defeating the Mongol Yuan dynasty and taking the imperial throne in 1368, the first Ming emperor, Zhu Yuanzhang, devoted his 30-year reign to an ambitious program of political, ethical, and ultimately metaphysical renewal. Through legal devices like the Great Ming Code, the Great Ming Commandment, and multiple imperial grand pronouncements, he disseminated from his capital in Nanjing a vast array of regulations which aimed to restore the practices of the traditional Han Chinese way of life. Baked into all these practices and regulations was a very distinctive model of the cosmos, 
one that had previously anchored life under the Qin, Han, Tang and Song dynasties. Like the Lakota example, this Ming model was composed of parallel celestial and terrestrial realms. The celestial realm contained a host of more than human beings, ranging from the great lords of heaven and earth themselves to obscure local deities and ancestral spirits. Also like the Lakota model, the earthly realm contained everything under heaven, including humans and all other terrestrial beings and things. But unlike the Lakota case, the Ming cosmos also included a pivotal third component, namely the son of heaven, the emperor himself, who had been authorized by heaven's mandate to coordinate between the two realms and thereby secure the cosmos as a single harmonious totality. For Zhu Zhuang Zhang in 1368, fulfilling this mandate meant realigning the earthly conduct of his subjects with the timeless principles of hierarchy, harmony and reciprocity that governed the heavenly order. It meant using new laws to revitalize the webs of relations that held the entire cosmos together and made it what it was. The most fundamental of these cosmic relations were those between humans and gods, relations that were sustained primarily through ritual interactions. Like their Dogon counterparts, the gods of Ming China may not have been visible as such, but they were continually present and active in everyday experience. As the ultimate overseers of human affairs, they continually revealed their wills and their judgments through things like the movements of celestial bodies, the passage of the seasons, weather events, dreams and portents. They duly resided in ritual spaces where they could observe human ceremonies firsthand and receive offerings. Because of the vital cosmic stakes of these interactions, the first Ming emperor's many ritual regulations were extremely meticulous, specifying every possible detail of sacrificial preparations, dress, music, incense, and so on. As designated son of heaven, only the emperor himself could make the great sacrifices to the lords of heaven and earth and to the imperial ancestors. His army of officials managed the rituals for most of the other cosmos sustaining gods, including the sun, moon and stars, mountains and rivers, soils and grains, the walls and moats of towns and local deities. As for lay people, they were encouraged only to make offerings to their own ancestors, since this practice of filial piety was self-evidently consonant with the heavenly order's principle of harmonious hierarchy. Probably second in importance in the cosmos were the relations between the emperor and his vast hierarchy of officials, through whom he managed all the provinces, prefectures, sub-prefectures and districts in, in the empire. Unlike the emperor and the people at large, the core of imperial officials was not a natural entity. It was rather a man-made device created by the emperor himself to help discharge his cosmic mandate. As such, officials served in effect as extensions of the emperor's own person, from which they were inseparable. They were the wings of the imperial swan, the scales of the imperial dragon, the fabrics of the imperial mansion. If the emperor was the head of the imperial body, they were its limbs, and all ideally acted as one with a single mind, will, and heart, with harsh punishments decreed for those who were in any way, in any way disloyal or disobedient. Working through this huge corporate body of imperial officials, the first Ming emperor used laws and other innovations to secure the well being of his people and harmonize human sentiment with heavenly principle. In a way, this began with the decision to locate his capital in Nanjing under the celestial pole star, the very axis of the heavens. In 1384, he went further, redesigning the whole imperial palace complex so that different buildings corresponded to appropriate celestial bodies. Beyond that, he revived the traditional 12 administrative divisions of Zhongguo, the Han-dominated empire proper. Each division was aligned with one of the 12 constellations of the zodiac, whose movements thereby governed the lives of humans below. More generally, if there was a single relational fabric that united the emperor's human subjects into a kind of single extended family, it was the traditional Confucian ethic of filial piety which was implicit in much of the early Ming legislation. Under Zhu Yuanzhang, filial piety became the paradigm for all forms of human relationship, 
between ruler and ruled, officials and lay people, old and young, husbands and wives. And this empire-wide injunction to preserve the time-honored hierarchies, harmonies and reciprocities of the Han way of life helped further to align the earthly realm with the eternal order of heaven. Again, there were no natural individuals. Again, all being was relational. Finally, let us travel through history's pluriverse to ancient Greece and consider the reality model that the ancient Athenians lit by during the classical era. Of course, the Athenian polis is widely seen as a cradle of our Western civilization and the ancestor of all our modern democracies. But all this overlooks the distinctly non-modern model of the world that was baked into all the practices on which the Athenians actually staked their lives. Through their way of life or politeia, they too daily enacted a world that was radically different from our own. This world of the Athenians was alive with things that defied our laws of nature. It teemed with gods, spirits, nymphs, fates, souls, curses, mysterious energies and magical forces. It was a world where humans were continually accountable to beings far more powerful than themselves. Above all, to the immortal divinities who controlled all the things that made life possible, from rainfall, sunlight and crop harvests, to bodily health, family wealth, sea voyages and military victories. There were over 200 gods in the Athenian pantheon, and like the gods of the Dogon and the Ming, these beings were immediately present in experience, in Athens itself, living in temples, receiving sacrifices, mingling with the Athenians at their festivals and dances, and continually preserving the well-being of their polis. There was no secular sphere in this world. Ritual activities were the business of real life. They were vital ecological mechanisms, not just religion. In the lived reality of the Athenians, there were no separate orders of nature and culture. Their lives were aligned with the rhythms of the seasons and the life cycles of plants and animals. Their land of Attica was not just some inert tract of property or territory, it was a living goddess, a divine earth mother with whom the Athenians shared a congenital family bond. Mother Attica herself had given birth to the first Athenians who sprang literally from her soil. She had then reared these human offspring, giving them the food and life skills necessary to maintain their young polis. And she had nurtured all their descendants ever since with her soils, crops, and other gifts. In return, the Athenians lavished her with offerings, tended her with tended her soils, and protected her from all harm. In Athenian reality, humans did not live for themselves as individuals. Male and female Athenians were born to serve the households that supplied the means of their existence. And these households together served the social body, which they all as one comprised, like the cells of a living organism. They called this social body demos, the people. And democratia was whatever this demos did to secure and maintain its own existence. Unlike a modern democracy, democratia was not a specialist political system. It was a form of politia, a total way of life. It thus included, for example, the essential business of managing households and raising children, duties which were typically performed by female members of the polis. It included the activities of the 139 deans in Attica, which brought together members of different households to order the affairs of their local neighborhoods. It included the contributions made by the 10 tribes, which brought together members of deans from different parts of Attica to perform vital ritual, military and rulemaking functions. And it of course included all the business transacted by the social body as a whole, whenever, Demo, whenever Athenians assembled as a united demos to enact major festivals, to vote on binding assembly decrees, to issue court verdicts and to wage war on battlefields. In short, Democratia was everywhere in Attica, whether, wherever male and female Athenians contributed to the life of their polis, whether acting as constituent parts of the social body or as the unitary totality of them all. It encompassed all the practices which secured their life-sustaining relations with their pantheon of gods, with their divine earth mother, and with each other. In the world they enacted in these practices, their polis 
was not just a form of human polity, it was a cosmic ecology, a symbiotic communion of humans, non-humans, and superhumans. Now, for all the obvious differences between the Lakota, Dogon, Ming, and Athenian visions of reality, there are also, I submit, some fundamental commonalities. In all four models of world, being is ultimately relational, not individual. Persons and things are effectively made of the relations which make their existence possible in the first place. In all four cases, humans are not exceptional because they share the properties of personhood with all kinds of other beings and agencies. In all four cases, humans are thus continually accountable to non-humans, especially to those that are more powerful than themselves. And in all four cases, the world cannot be reduced to objectively knowable materiality because one must humbly accept that some things are just not for humans to know. In all four cases, only the superhuman governors of the cosmos could possibly know all of life's mysteries. And these four cases are far from unusual. As far as one can tell, all non-modern peoples have lived by similar truths about relational being, about non-modern personhood, about human accountability to non-humans, and about the limits of human knowledge. All peoples, from those of ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, and South Asia, to those of medieval Europe and pre-colonial Peru, Guatemala, Polynesia, to those of the Amazon jungle, Australian desert, and the polar regions of Canada, Scandinavia, and Siberia. Our own modern Western reality with its individualism, its anthropocentrism, its secularism, and its impersonal material laws is in fact the great historical anomaly, the exotic exception to every rule. Yet despite this anomalousness, we just take it for granted that our clockwork human-centered model is the only one that is timeless, universal, and ultimately true. Endorsed by our objective science, it must be the only world that humans have ever really experienced, the only real world there is. We modern Westerners must be right and all other historical peoples are just wrong. It must just be a lucky accident that numberless non-modern peoples have flourished in history, sustaining their own real lives for hundreds if not thousands of years because the truths they lived by were clearly nothing more than myths delusions, and other false beliefs about the true nature of reality. Well, such sovereignistic assumptions about modern progress are what pass for common sense in our world today. But they are not just arrogant and maybe even hubristic. They have also had truly devastating historical consequences. To take just one of the more egregious examples, it is estimated that by 1900, the indigenous population of the Americas had declined by a staggering 95% as a direct or indirect result of European settler colonialism. This genocide was not just physical, but metaphysical. It meant the obliteration of countless non-modern worlds of experience and their enforced replacement with a modern European style world, an alien reality in which this carnage was apparently acceptable. And the torment did not end when the settlers declared their independence from European colonial powers. The integration of their new nation states into a global European style capitalist order has only perpetuated the exploitation, immiseration and dehumanization of indigenous communities to this day. It has imposed upon them what many now call a condition of racist coloniality, whereby they are deemed forever backward and inferior, forever a problem that impedes the forward march of modern progress and development. Their distinctive worlds of experience, realities which have, which have sustained whole ecologies successfully for centuries are just dismissed as mere figments of myth and belief. And they are forced to internalize the common sense of their oppressors to know themselves as primitives. And I would argue that we, in we historians are to a point complicit in this process. We help to normalize the modern coloniality of knowing and being through the tools and devices we use to tell our stories about all past peoples. Most obviously, we force all past peoples to inhabit a single universal scheme of time and space, 
disregarding all the other chronologies and geographies which humans have actually lived by. More insidiously, our conventional practice of history effectively colonizes the basic fabrics of all past realities, Western and non-Western. Our analytical devices allow us to play God with history's pluriverse, to universalize the worlds of all non-modern peoples and re-engineer them to fit our own modern model of reality. Standard accounts of classical Athens are typical in this respect. They just take it for granted that the polis was an abstract modern style societal space, one where experience could be divided into contradictory realms and fields like nature and culture, sacred and secular, public and private, the political, the social and the economic. And when the ancient evidence is forced into these abstract modern compartments, the destruction of a relational way of being human predictably follows. The real divine subjects who govern the polis ecology are downgraded to unreal objects of irrational religious belief. Mother Attica herself becomes nothing more than property, a territory or a natural environment. The unitary demos, the deathless social body of all male and female Athenians is atomized into an aggregate of natural self-interested individuals. And the whole ancestral way of life that was once called democratia is reduced to a proto-modern democracy, a narrow political system in which only males could be citizens. In sum, by imposing a present model of reality on all past worlds, our conventional practice dismembers the real ecologies which sustained the real lives of the peoples we study before then rebuilding them on alien, modern, metaphysical foundations. As a result, our histories always end up representing non-modern polities as immature versions of a modern nation state, rather than as fully realized versions of themselves. These accounts thus normalize and naturalize the bizarre human-centered secular world of the modern West, thereby turning modernity into inevitable destiny. They duly invalidate all non-modern ways of being human, perpetuating a racist coloniality of knowing and being. It is time to end this complicity and decolonize the past as we know it. Indigenous peoples have long been pressing the cause of decolonization, especially since the later 1960s. Their ultimate aim is to end modern coloniality by asserting their right to pursue their own ways of life in worlds of their own choosing or like the Maya-led Zapatista movement in Chiapas, they demand, quote, a world where many worlds fit. Historians can become allies in this cause by recognizing that pasts have been lived in a pluriverse of many worlds, not in a universe of just one. This means abandoning practices that destroy the essential fabrics of non-modern worlds. It means de-universalizing those worlds, analyzing them on their own terms, according to their own models of reality. It means restoring to past peoples the power to determine the truths of their own experiences. It means allowing them to decide for themselves what counts as a world in the first place. This pluriversal history should produce accounts of past worlds that are more ethical and more historically meaningful. But can we really believe in the existence of many different worlds? Dare we question objective scientific truths and change the way we think about the nature of reality itself? Yes, I think we should. After all, the idea of an objectively knowable world has long been questioned by authorities in multiple fields, from philosophy and anthropology to science studies, biology and quantum physics. Many would now agree that reality is in some way relational. All things are effectively made of their relations with the other things on which their existence depends. This means that we humans are just a thread in the fabric of being, much like everything else. We are just outcomes of entanglements with all the other beings and things that make our lives possible. And if one accepts this relational vision of reality, one must also accept the impossibility of any truly objective knowledge of the world for it is simply not possible for us to know a world that is somehow separate from or external to ourselves, as if we could somehow extricate ourselves from its fabrics 
and view it from outside, from nowhere, like gods. We will always know the world from a particular somewhere in time and space, from where, wherever we happen to be entangled. The world we know and how we know it or model it will always be determined by that particular somewhere, whether it be ancient Greece, a Dogon village or modern Europe. And if so, no historical model will ever be more universally or absolutely true than any other. Of course, our modern Western model seems universally true to us today because we live by it, enacting it every day of our lives. And it seems to work well enough in practice. We've been socialized by our schools and societies to take this model entirely for granted, since it is already baked into our capitalist economies, our liberal democracies, our mainstream media and sciences, and all the other major components of our modern Western way of life. This model is simultaneously embedded in the tissues of our minds and in the fabrics of our environments. And it is through the ongoing interactions between these minds and these environments that the effect of a materially self-evident world is generated, as if it had really been there all along. But this world of ours is no more timeless or universal than any of the other worlds which other minds and environments have conspired to produce across time and space. Every stable way of life entangles human and non-human participants in relational processes of world-making or worlding. And once we recognize that worlding processes are everywhere in history, a pluriverse of many worlds will begin to materialize before our eyes. If so, it would then make no sense to decide what counts as a world by modernity's own objective true standard. Instead, we can apply an altogether more practical ecological standard. We can measure the realness of a world by how well its worlding processes work in practice, by its capacity to sustain life itself, both human and non-human. Now, of course, there may be all kinds of non-modern practices that we today find abhorrent, but it is also unarguable the non-modern ways of worlding have successfully sustained the real lives of billions of humans for many thousands of years, whether in vast empires or in tiny face-to-face -face communities. And they've largely done this without inflicting catastrophic damage upon the living fabrics of the earth. In rather stark contrast, our strange modern European style way of worlding has imperiled the future of the whole planet in just a few hundred years. For all its technological marvels, it has stoked and unleashed forces which have caused all manner of horrors, genocides and ethnocides across entire continents. The exploitation and racist dehumanization of numerous colonized and enslaved peoples. The nightmares of industrial servitude, two monumentally destructive world wars, the Holocaust, nuclear weapons, epidemics of mental illness and drug addiction, open cast mining and factory farming, species extinctions and ecological devastation, and the whole age we now call the Anthropocene. And all for what? For a world where the richest 26 human individuals now own as much wealth as the poorest 3.6 billion combined? This is what happens when we enact a world which rewards us for prioritizing things over relations, humans over non-humans, and individuals over communities. By our alternative ecological standard, our modern Western way of worlding could be said to have failed disastrously in practice. But other real worlds are possible. They have been enacted and lived throughout history. They are being lived right now in what survives of history's pluriverse, in all those corners of the earth where sustainable non-modern realities have not yet been completely extinguished by an unsustainable modernity. All of us, historians included, need to support the wider cause of decolonization. And all of, all of us need to see that non-modern peoples, past and present, have much to teach us about valuing relations over things, about being more accountable to non-humans, about living in realities that are more balanced and less self-defeating than our own. We need to get over ourselves and start learning from them now before it's too late. We urgently need to imagine other ways of being human in other possible worlds.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. That was that was really thought provoking. Um, and I did love the PowerPoint as well, the slide. Oh, okay. I was like impressed as I was, <laughs> as you were moving along. I thought, oh, these are, these are all perfect slides for the things oh, that you're talking you. about. But there were, some of them were more in the, as I said, more in the line of evocative and suggestive than kind of declarative and definitive. But uh, I hope people managed to make sense of them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to open um, at the discussion. So if you, if anyone in the audience has a question, please either use the reaction um, button to raise your hand or just type in the chat room um, uh, that you have a question. And uh, Scott, you, yeah. you have a question, please. Please, yes, thank you so much for, I mean, uh, really stimulating and thoughtful uh, lecture. I, I was wondering if you could, I mean, you, you talk about the concept of worlding. I was wondering about the concept of timing or using, you, you mentioned time at various parts in your, in your lecture, uh, but uh, I would wonder more about the idea of time, specifically in terms of sequencing of events and how historians can write along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, Block famously said with the Yanal school that, that, that history was the science of man in time. And yet I, I, was, re I was reading once um, a work by Henrietta Whiteman of the Cheyenne Nation who uh, described it as she had a work called White Buffalo Woman, describing how she as a person today is actually the sum total of the entire history of her people. So that, that, that she is actually in in the current world, living through all the stages of the development of the Cheyenne. Mm -hmm. And it, it really struck me as something that could be really exciting to think about as a historical principle, that we, we tend to think about history evolving in, in stages and going through time. But if we shifted our focus to saying history is right now and the entire history of the world is epitomized right now mm -hmm. in the present moment, and I just wonder, I mean, I get the concept and I think it's a really intriguing one, particularly to be uh, post-colonial theory and, and uh, to uh, take away the imperial, imperial uh, program, but could that actually be written as history? What would, what would a history book without time and sequencing of events look like? That would be just taking a bit further of another principle that I think derives from your work. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for a very, very uh, thought-provoking question. Um, and uh, I, I guess my immediate answer to it would be, first of all, you know, to, con to consider the temporalities that the peoples we're studying have actually lived by. I think the example, the very eloquent example you just gave, um, uh, suggests a certain kind of temporality where that kind of simultaneous co-being, as it were, of multitudes inside a single what we would call individual, but what obviously isn't an individual in that particular context, is a, is a good example of a, you know, a very particular kind of a temporality and how that can work and be experienced in a very particular, within a very particular way of worlding, if you like. So I guess my immediate answer would be to think about, uh, to recognize and acknowledge the different temporalities of the peoples we study uh, have experienced. And just as a more sort of larger point about it, um, it's, uh, I guess I would just point out, you know, we historians, because modern academic history as a discipline has really evolved only within the modernity since, let's say, the last 200, 20 odd years, um, we are very used to change. <laughs> change to us is normal. You know, our kids grow up and talk about how they want to change the world. And that's like a thing that's admired and wanted in our world. It's not just normal, but, you know, admired. And, and I think it's so important for us to respect the fact, and this is true of the Greeks as, as much as it is of native peoples, that there is a, you know, that there isn't that historicism separating uh, the, 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 the present from the past, that sense of distance and detachment, and that sense of the inevitability of change or the 
proliferation of change. That is that we should expect there to be things happening every single year and that it's evolving in a kind of ongoing linear narrative. Um, that there are many other ways of experiencing the passage of time, not all of them linear. And, uh, you know, I mean, again, I'm struck in the, in the, just the Greek context where, you know, it would be easier to tell such a sort of linear narrative because we have people like Thucydides seeming to do much the same thing. Um, but to also see the fact that even in Thucydides, he talks about, you know, in the, in the very early part, the so-called archeology, span the beginning of uh, book one, he talks about the likes of Theseus and the likes of Agamemnon and so on as real historical beings, as real as Pericles was to him. Um, uh, and talking about empires and polis as if they're pretty much the same things back in you know, the time of Theseus as they are today. There is not that sense, at least I can't see, that sense of um, historicist distance or difference. Um, and, you know, there's an, a sort of a sense that we expect things to stay more or less the same, as opposed to in our world, we expect things to change. So, yeah, I think you put your finger on a point that is maybe one of the, you know, single most important things for historians to look out for when they study past worlds, which is to look at different temporalities and to look at how human relations are conceptualized in relation to temporality, because you gave such a good uh, illustration of that. Uh, while we uh, wait for other questions to appear, um, you know, I was thinking as you were talking, Greg, about um, the, the things that, and then I guess you go to the slide where you pointed out the things that these pre-modern societies have in common, or these different worlds have in common, right? And it was being relational and accountable, um, people being accountable to hu other humans or other uh, beings, um, and then the humility. And I guess for me, all those these values are positive. You know, they have these positive connotations, and then that's juxtaposed in your talk to modernity and like the evils of modernity, which I agree are all evils. And I'm just wondering. I guess whether you are comfortable with presenting this very positive image of these other worlds, and then how, you know, like, um, yeah, whether that juxtaposition then with modernity is yeah. skewed in some way. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think maybe it's important to stress here that what what we're talking about is comparing the presuppositions, the foundations of these worlds. The the so. And, and I would say what we today might, you, some people like you and I might regard as positive when looking back on a more relational way of being, on, on a more humble approach to knowledge and so forth, uh, you know, they wouldn't necessarily have been regarded positively uh, at the time because they would just have been seen as normal, natural, there's no alternative, you know. Uh, we, we might choose to see them as positive today, but uh, the, the, the deeper point is that we are talking here about, as it were, models of things. This is not to say for a moment, of course, needless to say, I hope, that there aren't, you know, millions of wonderful people in, in modernity who've done all kinds of wonderful things. What we're talking about is the premises of the world, the, the, the uh, as I say, the essential kind of model of the world that's sort of built into the machinery of our world, whether it's democracy and so on. What are the, what are we, what kind of a world is presupposed by democracy? Well, it's a world where we're all ultimately individuals. It's a world where we're born with these uh, particular rights, but we seem to need these rights to protect us from some public realm of the state where we're gonna be, you know, potentially uh, victimized or oppressed or, and so forth. All these presuppositions are kind of built into the modern world of our modern experience. What's interesting to me is how worlds of experience have been lived in real life that are built on entirely different principles. And yet these worlds seem to have survived uh, and one could say flourished, even if we ourselves today wouldn't want to live back then um, for all kinds of reasons. Again, this is, uh, you know, I, I want people to be clear. I'm not saying that we all ought to, uh, you know, I mean, I don't see, 
I guess I don't see things in terms of progress and regress. I see it as different worlds, different ways of being human, different possibilities, all of which are actually, have been practiced and experienced as real by communities all across time and space. So we take away the kind of the, the idea of the progress. It wouldn't necessarily be regress to live as people do say, you know, I, I don't know where the, uh, in the Amazon jungle or something like that. It's just different. And, uh, but at the same time, if we're thinking about how can we live other than what we're doing today, because obviously today there is a kind of urgency about things. And we have to try and put our finger on what it is about our modern world that seems to have generated this whole uh, age we call now the Anthropocene, this age of, uh, you know, of where I mean, certainly people in California don't need to be told about this, where there are obviously these seismic changes going on in our environment that we seem to have little or no control over. And, uh, but of course, it, uh, you know, and I think it's undeniable that industri the industrial modernity has had a major role in playing all of that. What I would like people to do is to look at the underlying, dare I say, metaphysical foundations, uh, you know, the, the common sense, as it were, on which that industrial world was built, uh, to look there for the problems rather than saying, well, it's so this company or that company or this CEO or whoever it is as being the great evil pantomime villain of the modern world uh, or some political leader or whatever. It's more about the common sense that underlies the whole thing. And to look at how, what very different kinds of common sense people have, one could fairly say, successfully live by. Doesn't it? Thank you. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think I also just come with these assumptions because my experience with non-dualism sure. is mostly from philosophy or Buddhism or whatever. So like where it's also, yeah. or even just how it's been appropriated today in, for therapeutical reasons. And so it's always very positive. So then I started questioning myself, like, am I just imposing these positive things? But thank you, that, that was really, oh, my pleasure. appreciate yeah. that. Um, Matt, you have a question. And then I saw Jamie also has one in the chat, but Matt, um, why don't you go first? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for that talk, Professor Anderson. It was wonderful, wonderful overview. Um, I have a question. So um, in terms of how you would, sort of apply your approach to the wider Greek world because you know you're talking about Athens and I just wondered I've, I've always wondered this uh, about your approach what would you say is happening in terms of like the exchanges between the Athenian culture that you are focused on but then other polis and other polyetic cultures and did they have I mean do we have to approach this thing on a sort of polis by polis case basis as to what their life worlds were. And, you know, I think in particular, especially in the period we're talking about in the fifth century, you know, a lot of people are looking at Athens and saying, oh, they do things differently there. And the Athenians are sort of just, well, I don't want to use the word disruption, it's awful. But, uh, you know, the, the Athenians are changing the way that people approach politics and they're, they're looking at this demokratia and, seeing that it's something else. And so I wonder, the, the question is, you know, how you would frame or incorporate exchange and change between the polis and how this affects their, their cultural world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. No, and very nice to meet you finally as well, uh, albeit remotely, and thanks for coming. Uh, no, it's a great question, and, I, and one that I, I have actually thought about quite a lot, um, because you, one might say, well, you know, there's so much that's sort of similar and overlapping about life in ancient Athens, even with Sparta, you know, obviously the, there are more commonalities than differences if, uh, if one looks at it. So to what extent is a given polis like a sort of self-contained microcosmic world? Um, so I think to a point we can look at it in those terms and I think we ought to. Uh, I certainly think Athenian practices and the practices of other polis encourage us to do so. After all, even though the, the divinities that they worship have a lot of overlap as it were, they all, they all presuppose that the, as it were, the boundaries between their community and let's say a neighbor to the east or the north or the west 
that there is not just a sort of some kind of physical boundary there, or if you like social one between the people on the one side and the people on the other, or, or what we would call maybe today even an, like an ethnic distinction, but that there is a metaphysical distinction. You think about the, the practices where, you know, the Athenians, uh, when a family is cursed and they dig up the bones, famously the Alcmeonid case, they dig up the bones of the, uh, the members of the cursed family. So the bones themselves are cursed, which is interesting when considering, you know, the, the, they actually didn't um, engender the curse in the first place, but because this is something possessed by a whole family, that's the first interesting thing. But the second thing is we expel them beyond the bounds of the polis. In other words, presumably in Athens, that means burying them somewhere in, you know, the Megarid or in Boeotia. Now, it's clearly assumed that the, whatever pollution comes with these bones does not infect Boeotia or the Megarid. It's like you get it beyond the metaphysical borders of Attica and different rules apply, as it were. There is a, a certain sense in which one could say maybe that the community of Poles, uh, the extended community of Poles and other kinds of communities in mainland Greece, is a sort of a, to a point, a kind of a pluribus, albeit obviously a very permeable one. And I, I certainly don't want to give the impression, even when we talk about uh, a, a, on a more kind of global level about the pluribus, that these are hermetically sealed uh, communities or worlds. Clearly there is ongoing interaction, ongoing exchange going on between them that complicates any idea that there's a sort of, there can be ever a purity to them. Um, so uh, I totally take the point, of course, as you suggest, that there are going to be exchanges of all different kinds, uh, networks of different kinds that, that kind of cross between worlds. But I would also suggest on the other side that I do think the Greeks had a naturally, dare I say, pluriversal way of thinking about themselves in relations to others, to appoint other Greeks were inhabitants of somewhat distinct worlds, albeit the features of the worlds were similar to their own. But then if you certainly if you read something like Herodotus or never mind Homer, you can see that there, the, there is definitely a sense that other peoples are not just what we would call culturally different from Greeks, they are naturally different. That is, there's a whole different range of plants, whole different range of animals, even the people, the humans themselves uh, behave differently, are naturally different from Greeks. Uh, I think of the, obviously, the extended Egypt uh, book, uh, book two in Herodotus, where everything is kind of the reverse of Greece, even though there's a lot of commonalities. Uh, never mind when you get to Scythians and people, you know, Hyperboreans at the very ends of the earth, uh, the further you get away from central Greece, the more extreme the differences get. But these are differences, I think, of fusis rather than just nomos. Um, and uh, so I think, and I actually gave a paper once which made this case that uh, the Greeks lived in what I think we could call a pluriverse of many worlds rather than a universe of one. But obviously the mini Greek polis worlds are more similar to each other than between the Greeks and the Hyperboreans. The worlds get more different, I guess, as you get away from central Greece. So that would be my way of thinking about it, uh, if that's helpful to you, Matt. Thanks again for the question. Um, Jamie, who is apparently is one of our grad students and is sleepless oh, yeah. in Athens. <laughs> um, did you want to ask your question directly, Jamie, or do you want me to read it out loud? Sure, I, can, I can go ahead and go for it. I just <laughs> figured it might be easier. It's uh, 3 a.m. here, so and I just got done with the conference myself that was overseas, so I'm a little... <laughs> Uh, fuzzy, but uh, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, I read one of your papers in graduate school many years ago. It was on the I think the the the, the ontological turn with the economy. Loved it, uh, and so ever since then I've been been a big fan. Um, so I think what was motivating my question was I was listening to the beginning of your talk, and I was thinking wow, this is what it's like to kind of like be one of my students, put myself in like this different world. And I kind of had this realization that this is, well, one, I'm listening to you and you're a fantastic speaker. And so you're explaining it 10 times better than I ever could. But like, it was, it was kind of like this realization, like it was so kind of foreign to me. And so 
thinking about, you know, my students who are in this like in a position where they're thinking about, um, you know, the ancient world for the first time, they're putting themselves in, you know, this position. And um, in, in my research, I focused on Julian. And so, you know, I just gave a talk where I was talking about like, you know, the difference between the Usia of the gods and the Fusus of humans, and, you know, how to get from one to the other. And so when you're so embedded in it, it's kind of hard to kind of step back and think, how do you actually, um, you know, convey this in a way that's going to make sense to others? So I was wondering, since you really deal with this, do you have any concrete tips, um, you know, when it comes to teaching that actually really help students to kind of say, oh, wow. And I know that, uh, you know, Denise mentioned that her students really got a kick out of your TED talk, but um, besides having them listen to your, your, your TED talk, uh, just like any tips that you could give would be greatly appreciated. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, for a love. Did, did you say you're in Athens right now? Uh, I am. It's, it's I think, uh, 3.15 here. <laughs> pretty late. Say, yeah, it's, <laughs> you're up pretty, pretty late, even by Greek standards, you're up pretty late. Yeah. There. But uh, are you with uh, like a group of undergrads over there or are you by, by yourself uh, doing your research? I am at the American School doing research. Oh. I was, uh, I was at a conference uh, online in, in Britain, but they thought that I was in the United States. And so they accommodated me and now I feel bad. So. <laughs> oh, right. So you're in the Salo in the Saloni in the American school right now. Well, that's, uh, um, mm -hmm. all right. Well, thank you again for a great question. Uh, no, it is a good question. And I'll be quite honest with you that when I teach, let's say a survey of classical Greek history or archaic Greece, I teach the both two surveys uh, during the year there. And they're both pretty introductory. And I don't go into it saying, okay, you guys, now we're going to do, we're going to take an ontological turn in our practice, because I think it would just <laughs> be too much for them and freak people out. So what I do, I guess you could say is more of a stealth way of doing it. We still mm -hmm. do what one would recognize as a standard sort of narrative. And you might say, well, that's against your principles, Professor Anderson, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, kind of intellectually dishonest. Um, but again, we have to think practically about how people are going to be receptive to things. Uh, if I knock away all the, the kind of foundations and I just say, well, tear up your textbooks, it's all wrong, which I don't actually believe anyway, but uh, I, I'm not going to do that. So what I would do is we tend to dwell on the topics like, say, oikos or polis and mm -hmm. democratia and what those things mean uh, mean to the Greeks and how, at least as I understand, as far as I can tell after all these years. And uh, so we go into it that way. So there is still a kind of chronological, uh, you know, timeline along which to, 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 to hold things, but we have these digressions, if you like, all along the way. Obviously, what people call religion is a very big topic as well. So there I will go into, well, what, what, how did the Greeks experience these things? You know, what did they, what did, what did personhood mean to them? Uh, you know, this idea of relational being within an oikos or within a polis at large, and of course, gods and their vast importance uh, in the uh, in the reality of uh, classical Greece. So I tend to do it through those topics. And again, I avoid, you know, language like ontological and metaphysical, which always scares people and uh, uh, just make it seem very commonsensical, really, uh, because in a way, you know, what I'm trying to do is get at what the Greek common sense about these things was. And I think part of the the struggle we have here is that People tend to think of what, you know, when they think of Greek thought, they think about Aristotle or they think about Plato. They think about the great, you know, uh, intellect, intellectuals of the era as if they are representative of Greek, Greek thought. But of course, they are all oppositional writers. They're all, in some sense, critiquing the common sense of the time. The common sense is what's built into the actual mechanisms of everyday life. And so getting at those mechanisms and getting at that common sense is what I encourage students to do. And many of them seem to get it and they find it a lot more interesting as a result. So that would be my advice to focus on the particular topics where these differences between, let's say, our way of doing things and theirs. And I will often be very explicit about, well, you know, how does the modern idea of the family contrast with an ancient Greek oikos. What are the main differences here? And it comes down to the essential, what you think the essential purpose of such an, a unit even is. So uh, 
so that's the sort of the way I would do it in a sort of topic by topic kind of way rather than grand philosophical pronouncement at the beginning of the course saying we're going to do things differently. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for that advice. Uh, I really like looking at, you know, the grand thinkers as kind of critiquing it and kind of yes. going with them backwards. Now. Thank you. My pleasure, Jamie. Thank you for the great question. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, Jerry. Jerry you're, Jerry, you're muted. For a second time, yeah. <laughs> the lecture was very uh, thought provoking and I couldn't help but think about modern society and how we have these technological advances and how they have shaped human behavior throughout the years. It makes you think, where are we going with this? I think we're becoming less personal with each other to some extent less human and we're relying more on social media like this and you know a lot of people don't pick up the phone and talk to you they either email you or give you a um, a text so and i think it's technology it shapes human behavior quite a bit so and you know you can't answer this but where do you think we're going with this i mean it's getting worse and worse yeah I, I, it's a great question jerry and uh uh, I wish I knew. I wish I knew the answer. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess what Looking I would back like, at history, you know. I mean, what's yes, yes. Uh, I don't think the problem is. I don't think there's any precedent for this at all. I think we're we're in a moment right now that is so radically different, even from what your parents uh, might oh, yeah. have experienced. You know, and I, I know in I, in your family's case that I, I assume your your parents were born in Greece and uh, yes. probably maybe uh you know remembered the time of the certainly second world war and maybe somewhat before then as well uh, and obviously yeah. radically different life i sometimes think of even my, my my own parents are you know were kids in the second world war the world they grew up in is radically different from the one we live in now greek world is somewhat more different i would say because in the western dare we say anglo-saxon parts of the world mm -hmm. this kind of individualist way of being is uh, obviously that's where it comes from originally and uh, in the likes of John Locke and Adam Smith and so forth there are still all kinds of uh, contents of a uh, even today in Greece uh, with where you know the Orthodox Church the the strength of family life and so forth is taken for granted so that the idea that one is made of one's relations with other people is not so maybe alien let's say to a family in parts of Greece today as it might be to someone in Britain, uh, I would say. Um, and, uh, but where it's all going, I mean, I only see it getting more and more the case like you're describing. When you start to think about in terms of relations, like all the relations that make us who we are as people, as beings, and you think about what kinds of all the just millions of like little networks that make our lives possible. Think about getting up in the morning. We wake up, your clothes you're wearing, the night clothes you wear. Where were these things made? Who made them? We don't know. You clean your teeth in the morning with that toothpaste. Who designed that toothpaste? Where's the technology coming from? This long train of scientists in laboratories. We'll never know the names of any of them. Uh, you know, we don't know the names of the people at Colgate who actually made this particular toothpaste. You get to your breakfast table, you pour out your cornflakes. What forest do the, does the wood pulp come from that make the box of the cornflakes? Where was the corn grown? Who knows? Right. Who grew it? So, you know, whereas if you go back in time to, you know, let's say pre-modern worlds, there's a better chance they would have known, like, who made all the equivalent things that we've just described, the clothes you're wearing, the food you're eating. Maybe it only came from within like 20 miles radius of where you grew up. Yet we are getting more and more, more parts of our lives, the things that make us who we are, because toothpaste helps, it contributes a little bit to who we are. Cornflakes do, clothes do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so many of these things are impersonal relations now because it's a global networks of things that are producing all the goods we depend on. Um, we are becoming ever more kind of 
ever more connected, but in ever more impersonal ways. Uh, um, so, uh, no, I fully sympathize. And I, I guess I would just hope that people might give this all more thought. And maybe there, are, you know, there comes a point when people think it might be a good idea, for example, to put the names of the people who actually harvested the corn on the packets of the cornflakes. Why not do that? Why not give a name to this? Personalize it. Yeah, exactly. Who designed this toothpaste, for God's sake, you know? And it may be a whole train of people, but, uh, you know, just personalize it all in some way. The T-shirt you're wearing, like, who actually made that? You know, we just say... Probably this. made in China or Taiwan. Well, that's right. <laughs> but it just says made in China. Like, who were the actual human beings who made it? And who grew the cotton to make it from, you know? Uh, where were the fields located? It would be nice to know these things that would be another way of sort of pushing back against it i think but yeah exactly become a little bit more human yes we can hope we can hope okay thank Thanks you for the question Jen. thank you i i feel that our students i don't know there's been a shift in the last few years and that me i i feel a bit more optimistic i guess yes. <laughs> i think that they are also sort of concerned about some of these issues absolutely now i noticed i've noticed it a lot I, you know teaching uh, over the last, I guess, 25 years now, a uh, huge change in students from, let's say, the Clinton era of uh, total disinterest in the wider world and political things and humane causes, etc., versus now when students are much better informed about these things, partly, I think, because of social media, um, but also they just seem to be more they seem to care more, you know, about what's going on in the world around them than, than, than they were doing, you know, even 15 years ago, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Um, are there any other, any more questions? Uh, if not, then uh, let's thank Greg again for this fantastic talk.